Well, good morning, Central Wesley, and thank you, worship team, that leads us right into what we want to talk about this morning. Uh, before I share the message with you today, I'm going to bring a couple of personal thoughts and ideas I'd love to share with you just as a group of people. So many of you would not know this, but going back 30 years ago, I was on staff here for many years. My wife Jane and I uh, raised our children here. You're the house that built me, and I get to preach a lot of different places. We were in Baton Rouge this week speaking, and no matter where I go, no matter what I do, um, when I get invited, I'm so thankful to Pastor Craig for allowing me this opportunity. When I get invited to speak here, it's just different than anywhere else. It's coming home. It's, it's the place where I realized that God uh, gave me an opportunity to launch a ministry. And, and I'm just so grateful, so grateful for those of you who were back in the day. You were here. You were patient with me and all my flaws, all my mistakes. And you still loved us and prayed for us, and I'm just so grateful. And I just tell you today that I'm grateful for this opportunity to preach here, and I pray the Lord will use the words I share this morning to encourage you. And I want to I want to just share a couple of things with you this morning. Um, I'm coming back on September the 18th, and that Sunday evening we have our second night of hope. If you experienced it last year, you know it was a really special time. Uh, God came and was with us in a powerful way. And I want to explain a little bit of the night. Our purpose is just to give you hope. Our purpose is to encourage your spirit. Uh, all of us have some brokenness in us. All of us have some issues in our life. And this is one of those times where you just come and go, I'm okay. I'm going to be all right. God loves me. This world beats me up. And life is challenging, just like Deb showed us in the video. But God is with me. And that's what this night's about. And I want to just tell you that if you have a neighbor, have a friend, have a long lost distant relative, uh, this is the type of night to bring them. They're going to feel loved. They're going to feel cared for. I'm going to tell a story from the life of Jesus and the story's about you. And so I trust and pray you'll put on your calendar Sunday night, September 18th. Please come and just be a part of that awesome night together. And then secondly... I want to ask you to pray for something. There's a, there's a little slide coming up on the screen, and it's going to look self-promotional. I get that. This was just a slide we have. But I, I don't want you to look or care anything about that release thing. I was mowing my grass a couple of nights ago and just really felt the Lord lay on my heart, ask your home church, ask the people who are part of your whole launch of your life and ministry, ask them to pray for this. So... This group called Salem Communication approached us about a year ago and said, would you write a book about all the issues that parents are facing in our society, that teens are going through in our society, that kids are dealing with, the things that make them anxious, the thing that makes them scared, etc. And so Winning at Home put together this book. I didn't name that book. Salem Communication said, can we name the book Winning at Home? And I said, of course. So that, that's good for us. But on the other side of the coin, I want to tell you that with this book being released on September the 13th, uh, they are saying, hey, you need to be prepared for a tax, that sort of thing. So I just really want to ask for a favor. I don't care about you getting the book. What I would like to do is ask you to pray because this book very clearly focuses people on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It shows us that our identity is not found in what this world says. It's what Jesus says about us. And so I would just invite you to pray for the launch of this book, that God would use it. I'm doing interviews all across the country, and I'm just talking about Jesus. So I would just love to ask you as support team today, I asked Pastor Craig, and, and I'm so grateful he lets me just take a moment and share this. And so I would just love your prayers, and I thank you for that, and that's all I want to say. And now I want to preach the message, I believe the Lord's laid on my heart. This series is called Point of View. As you see behind me there on stage, there's a little stepping stool. That stool is going to represent God's point of view about you. Where I'm standing and going down even here and going down even lower, I'm going to let represent what the world thinks about you and what the world tries to tell you that you are. And I want you to know, I'm going to start uh, with something. I didn't do this in first service, but I'm going to start here today. So I have this little stool in my office I sit on when I work on a message. 
And I sat on the little stool, and I was like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to, to talk about? What do you want me to say? What do, what do you want me to do as part of this message on discovering our identity in you? And I felt like the Lord very clearly laid on my heart, make sure that those who would look up on stage and see you as an older man, which is probably, you know, 90% of you, I get that. But those of you who are maybe millennials and younger, I'm just asking you today, don't hear me. Listen to what the Lord would say to you during this message about where you are to find your identity. Because the world has given you all kind of places to find your identity. It drags you here. It pulls you over there. It goes in the other places. And it's just kind of the way the world is. But very seldom do we step up on this little platform and take this view of, what does God say about me? What does his word say about me? See, for most of us, we do this, um, maybe, I hope many of you have your personal devotions, but it's not a huge part of your day. It's minutes. And then you go 24-7 out in the world, and its opinions and ideas and its posts are there all day long for you to read. And for most of us, about an hour a week, we pause and come in to worship God and say, what do you think of us? But I want you to step back a second and think about it. What if that was flipped? What if this was all the time we spent with the world and all that was the time we spent with God? We would find more of identity in him. Henry Nouwen, a famous Dutch theologian, says we identify ourselves as people by three different ways. He said, first of all, we identify ourselves by what we do. Secondly, by what we have. And third, by what someone has said about us. So let's break that down for a second. If I pause and say, okay, let's just play in this game. The world identifies us, number one, by what we do. I'm going to yell a name, and I want you to yell back who this person is. You ready? Who is Michael Jordan? Yeah, sure, right there. I mean, almost in unison, basketball player. And I would say to you, that's what he did. But I wonder, I wonder even last night, if Michael Jordan wakes up at 2.30 in the morning like some of us and goes, who am I really? How's my family really doing? If you watched any of The Last Dance, which was a beautiful story of part of his life that came out during the pandemic, you saw another side of Jordan. You saw the competitor, but you also saw him sit and cry on screen just wishing people understood him. And I say to you today that Michael Jordan sometimes wakes up and wonders, who am I? What am I really about? You know, when I was youth pastor here, uh, I wrote Michael a letter, probably for about a year, I, I wrote him a letter every week. And, you know, I was a Jordan fan way back. In the day, you know, people talk about LeBron, please. I was a Jordan fan back in the day, and, and um, you know, my brother-in-law went to college, had a class with him, so I started following him in North Carolina, and then he comes to Chicago, you know, two and a half hours away. I got to go see a game, and you know, got to see him in person, and, and then, you know, as a youth pastor, loved to play basketball with all the teens out in the gym here, and, and Jordan was it. And then I just, what happened was there was a family who went to Central who lived in Florida in the uh, winter time. And Jordan, of course, when there were uh, off season, he lived in Florida. And this person that attended here at Central was actually his neighbor. And he told me, hey, I see, he would call me sometimes and say, hey, Jordan's going to get his mail and his boxers right now. You know, he would tell me this stuff. And I'm like, dude, give me his address. I want to write him a letter. So I started writing him letters. You know, once every week, I would jot a letter just saying, hey, you don't know me, Dan, live in Michigan, youth pastor. Just wanted you to know you're prayed for today. So I started doing this. And then I remember uh, his father was killed, a tragic accident. His father was shot. I remember writing a letter that week saying, dude, I can't imagine what you're going, you're famous. Everybody knows you can't even go out in public, but you've got to be hurting, bro. You've got to be struggling today. And so you just know there's a youth pastor up in Michigan praying for you, Dan. Just so you know, never responded to any of my letters. But I kept writing. 
And I did it partly because Michael Jordan is a person. He is a person who God looks down and says, I have a plan for you, and it's even bigger than basketball. I can use you for my glory. Secondly, Henry Nouwen says we are known by what we have. If I say the name Elon Musk, most of you at least have heard it. $400 billion man, pretty much buy any things he wants. Sits around in toys with buying things like Twitter. I mean, it's just who he is. And we would look, the world looks. I mean, you know, when Elon Musk speaks, stocks go up and down and people buy crypto. And I mean, anything he says, it influences the world. Wow, people are like, oh, if I could just get that platform because in the world that platform looks so big. But I would say to you, that platform can leave you so lonely. I tell you that Elon Musk, I'm not in his house but I would bet what little money I have that he sometimes wakes up at 2.30 in the morning and goes, what am I about? I don't know if you saw it about four weeks ago. Uh, something happened in his family. It was in the news momentarily. I don't know if you notice this or feel this, but sometimes I think things can kind of be controlled in the media. So it's not really noticed that much, but... About a month ago, his youngest daughter, um, she went public with she no longer wanted to be his kid. She wanted to change her last name. She wanted out of his life. The richest man in the world had a teenage daughter who disowned him. I will tell you, I believe he woke up in the middle of that night going, all my money. And I can't buy her love. And I would say to you that the God who created Elon Musk would say to him, come see what I say about you. A third thing, and this one's going to be personal for you. A third thing Henry Nouwen says is that we are identified by what someone has said about us. Oh, my goodness. I pause a moment to look at eyes around this place and go, how many of you had something said at some point in your life that you still struggle with? It, like, identified you. And for all your life, you've gone, I wonder if I'm that. You know, you've heard me say my father when I was a little boy said he was angry at me and talking to my mom, didn't know I was listening. And he said, I just wish he would have never been born. I've, I've told you my dad said that before. And I, when I was youth pastor here, I would wake up crying at night, having this nightmare of my dad wishing I'd never been born. And so, and so I worked so hard to get your approval. I just confess it, man. I, I go back and I'm, I'm 61 now. I'm... I, I appreciate y'all, but I don't need your approval anymore. The reason is I'm figuring out that standing on that little plate, God loves me. I find we are so performance driven. I, I want you to like me, so I'll, I'll try to do a good speech. And I'll, I'll, you pick your thing. Forget about it. I'm just telling about my life, but you got your stuff too. You try to perform and you want everybody, oh, oh they, they like me. I got some likes. It's just the way it is. And we become identified with our likes and our dislikes. And I want to propose to you a fourth thing in 2022 to add to Henry Nouwen's list. I want to propose a fourth way we identify ourselves by what we say we are. Today I'm this, tomorrow I'll be that. I speak to those of you who are millennial and younger the world is telling you right now, you're whoever you say you are today. And I want to tell you that, you know, we have a counseling center right here in Zealand. One downtown on 16th Street, one in Tampa Bay, one in Rwanda, and there are more that are springing up. And I tell you, the phone calls that are coming in are teens and kids going, I don't know who I am. 
I'm confused. And I understand. I get it. It makes sense to me that you would be confused. When I speak to teens these days, I'm an old youth pastor. I still love to speak to teens and kids. And, and when I speak to teens, I start by apologizing. And I say to them, I'm sorry. There doesn't appear to be a lot of adults in the room who are telling you the truth from what God's word says. And we aren't walking along beside you. We're judging you. We're picking out your flaws and we got enough of our own. We need to come along beside you and show you some maturity. And I apologize, you aren't getting that. And so teens sitting here today who might be confused, somebody who didn't even come to church this morning because you're struggling with your own identity, I, I say to you, sorry, sorry. There hasn't been that example of showing you what God's word says. So that's where I'm going today. I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm not giving you what I think. I'm going to tell you what God's word says about you. So I move from this 24-7 constant environment, sometimes back in the shadows, sometimes back behind the wall. Huge stage, good grief. We walk in it 24-7. I pause today to step up on here, and I want to tell you what God says about you. Let me just say to you, today is probably going to be the beginning for someone to begin to find your identity in the correct place. I'm not telling you that one sermon is done, got it figured out. No, but this is the starting point in a world that gives you a lot of opinions. And I start with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. The Word of God says this, we are God's handiwork. I'm, I'm gonna stop. Listen to me. You are God's handiwork. He made you. I'm just discovering what this means. I knew it. When I was a youth pastor here at Central, I knew I was God's kid. But I didn't really recognize it. I didn't recognize the significance of how much it could change the peace inside me. Because, see, I, I wanted your approval. By God's grace, I'm past that place I I give all glory to him you're looking at a much more content man today because I'm not trying to find my peace from somebody it's painful it's not always easy but it's good because I'm God's boy L listen to me you're God's kid you don't have to fight to know where your identity come from. God looks at you today like, like I'm not God, okay, but hear his words to you. You are my handiwork. You're special. I created you unique. Jane and I were speaking in Napanee, Indiana. That's Amish country. And we went um, to a place to eat at a restaurant. Then we went out to a little place that sold furniture. And there was normal furniture. Then there was special hand crafted Amish furniture let me just say a bit pricey I said why is this much why is this so much more expensive and the guy's like because it was handicraft made by Amish people there's no manufacturing in this one it was touched by the creator's hand oh that's you you're valuable Created, as this verse says, purposed in Christ for a reason. Somebody listening right now. Somebody listening right now goes, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he is just a preacher. They probably pay him. He, he's just, that's what he's supposed to say. He's just living his life. He is old. He's right. He's old. So, he, I, I don't know. I don't know. But something, some inkling down in your soul right now is going, but it does make sense that there's got to be more than I think there is to my life. The world is saying, I'm God. 
I, I, I can prove that. I have here with me. Um, I have a little something that hit my phone the other day, a little email hit my phone, and I printed it off because I wanted to read it to you. Um, and I'm going to apologize as part of what I'm sharing right here for the way I used to be because I was really wrong, and I need to confess that to those who even heard me preach. Um, this Grammy Award-winning singer, very famous, teens in here would know this name, Teens in here would listen to her music. You might even have it on your playlist right now. Like you might even have an earphone in pumping it right now. I don't know. But this Grammy Award winning singer posted this the other day and said this. And it hit my phone so I printed it off to talk about how in our world today we have teenagers telling other teenagers, you're God. Her, her words are this, so I don't see myself solely as a woman. I feel all my energy. I feel like God is so much bigger than the he or the she. And if I'm God, then I really am everything. So I go back to when I was youth pastor. If you had been in the youth group when I was youth pastor, I would have, I would have come up with a little gimmicky, funny statement to say about her. I'd have got everybody to laugh, maybe most of the people to laugh. I'd have took a cheap shot at her. I was so wrong, and I'm so sorry if I preached that way and you heard me. She doesn't understand who gave her the voice she uses to sing. She's God's girl. He has a plan for her. He created that voice, I believe, to praise him. And she's lost. And she's got a million followers, and she's leading them to more lostness. And I hope she knows her own quote, and somehow, someday, she actually sees this little video. And I hope she sees, and I'm looking right into the camera with the light on, because if you ever see it, and I won't say your name, because I'm protecting you. But if you ever see this, I want you to know your creator loves you so much. And I'm so sorry if somewhere in your past some preacher said something stupid because I used to. And now that I'm discovering who I really am, I want you to find out the same thing because it changes the game. Because as I read all this, I can see you're hurting. And today in this room, some of you are listening to things that yeah, it gives you a temporary high or a quick little fix. And, and God says... Can you stop looking for your identity out here? Can you stop first trying to identify who you are based on sexual things and gender things? Before you find any of that stuff out, can you know that I handcrafted you in your mother's womb? So simple. This is, this is such a simple message. And I've spent a lot of time, I sat on that stool in my office, I spent a lot of time thinking about this little, this little womb. Why is, it such a, why is it such a controversial thing in our world? That verses series is coming up. Why, why is everything so verses all the time? Especially anything related to God's creation. Did you know, did you know if you're listening to me right now, did you know you were once in that womb and you were protected by your mom? And I thought about, why'd God pick here? I sat on my stool and thought about, wow, there's so many ways God could have decided to procreate. He, he got to decide how all that was going to start in the beginning. God, God did that. And he chose this little spot. Why? Why, why, didn't, why didn't he put the baby like out on the arm? Like, like, you know, you ladies walking around, you'd be tilted. You know, got 60 pounds. No, he didn't do that. Why didn't he just put it on both hands? You got identical twins coming. I mean, you know, why, why did he choose this place? Safe. And he knew a mother's love is intense. You mess with a mom's kid. So what would Satan try to do? Go after this sacred place where, look, 
the Bible says we're created in his image. Some of you moms in here today, maybe even a mom who you made a choice that you look back and you know you're forgiven. When you say, Father, forgive me, you're, you're good. I'm just trying to help you realize I don't want more mothers living with the pain of that. And you say, Dan, you're trying to be controversial. I'm actually trying to be the exact opposite. I'm trying to help you see the image of God was created in the womb, so of course Satan's going to hate it. I mean, you, you understand God could have had us born a lot of different ways. And I'm not trying to say this to get a laugh, but I, I thought about you moms. You're, you're born with eggs inside you, and, and you know, you... you have children it comes from those eggs that were planted in you when you were born and and I'm just thinking about God could have said you know what it works with the chickens I'm I'm just gonna have them drop eggs so you moms could have walked on and went hey there's another one and they, and it falls out and say to the dad sit on it for three weeks and we're good to go yeah that could have been the way he did it but he didn't because he wanted it protected and I say to you today you're handcrafted for God's, per- your life's not about you. The world goes, yes, it is. I do what I want. Okay, but why are you so stinking lonely? Why are you hurting so bad? Why, why at the end of that thing when you chase everything you want, why are you so angry? Why are you not peaceful? Because anything that is not recognizing the supremacy of how God made you will lead you to lostness emptiness inside you say Dan is this your idea no I I told you the verse says you're God's handiwork that's his plan and his purpose for you I watched this thing called uh, antique road show have y'all seen this antique road show you know it's it's shown it's a history show basically it's people walking in with things that they want to check and see how much it's worth and I'm a collector of stuff I I love these kind of shows I would I would collect way more stuff if Jane would let me I just love to collect stuff and I love to watch it because I love to see what was something somebody had they thought was worthless and so I watched this one show and this lady's walking in you know they're standing in this long line you have to wait because they're up there and then you get up there but if they come and choose you and pick you out of line sir let me see what's under your arm oh, me oh me and then you get pretty excited and they take you over if you get a table man if they put you by a table you know something good's about to happen and this lady had a painting under her arm and they called her out of line and she walks up to the little table, and the proprietor says to her, what is this, ma'am? To which she replies, I don't know. It's a painting. He's like, where did you get this painting? Picked it up at a garage sale. How much? Five bucks. Five bucks. And the guy starts talking to her about it. Well, this painting, you know, they have those little pointers. Well, this painting, as you can see right here, and over on the back. And, you know, and the whole time he's talking, you're going, oh, boy. She's got something here. This is an original, ma'am. This artist is well known. And though, you know, many people don't know it is, it, this, is this is quite a piece you've fallen into. You know, and the whole time, you know exactly what she's thinking. How much? How much? Care less his name, how much is it worth? And then eventually he looks at her and goes, ma'am, if I, if I were to insure this, and you always like to use the insurance number because that's really high. And he says, I would insure it for this amount. And she is literally, <laughs> she just like, I can't believe it. This is unreal. Two minutes ago, and it's probably a piece of junk. I don't know anybody. Excuse me? Me? Okay, sure. Two minutes later. <laughs> I say to you today, if you could really understand your value, you'd probably cry right now. You'd probably cry right now. Because there are some garage sale feeling people sitting in here. I'm not stupid. I have those days too. And when you understand 
God wants to put you up on his little platform and he wants to say, I got, I got something I need you to do for me. And I just need you first to understand, I love you. You don't have to fight for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to jump through a hoop. You are just loved. But, but what do I need? You are just loved. Somebody in here today, listen to me say it. Somebody online, listen to me say it. You are just loved because you are. And that makes no sense because 24-7 we fight for love. How, will you date me? No. Will you be in a relationship with me? No. Can I have a job here? No. You're just not quite good enough. No, you're a little too short, a little too tall, nose too big, ears too wide. You, nope, you don't fit in. Mm, we'd love to have you part of our small group, but not this time. You know, maybe in the next 30 years. And these constant rejections even rejecting ourselves. And then all of a sudden, God says, I love you. It's hard to get. It's hard to believe. And I would tell you in the last three to five years for sure, I'm starting to realize he just loves me. Am I worth it? I don't feel like it, but he loves me. You aren't garage sale material. You're purposed for God. You say, well, what does that mean? Uh, I'm still figuring that out for myself. You know you're not. You're up there preaching. No, nah, this isn't, you know, this is my calling. It's what I do, but what if I lost my voice today? Am I still valuable to God? Mm-hmm. So, Dan, if you, if you lost your ability, right, he doesn't base his love on, where are you speaking next week? Nope. He bases his love on his fact that he loves me. And when I find my identity there, game changer. Game changer. Who are you today? Are you what you have? Are you... What people say about you, are you basing it on what you do? Do you walk in a room and you like it that people go, oh, that, hey, that's so-and-so. You know what they on? Look, look at there, look at they drive a Tesla. That's Elon Musk's car. Wow. Do you find your identity in that? Do you you say, Dan, we can't have stuff. Have all you want. Just don't find your identity in it. Be all you can be. Just make sure it's to glorify God. And from that, look, look normally when Christians get to this place, you know, you know what we usually use it as? A stage of judgment. Look at all of these people. Look over there, struggling over there. Look over there, that sinner! should be just the opposite a bigger point of view where we go oh my goodness that's me and God why do I deserve to be loved the way I am help me help me help these people find this because there's so much joy in it well they attacked me yeah they they killed Jesus yeah you're going to be attacked and you get to respond with the attacks with love People hate you and you get to love them back. Oh, it's a brand new idea. And then it says in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 20, the second thing God says about you is that your citizenship is not of this earth. (laughs) We eagerly await a Savior. You, You don't belong to this earth ultimately. So you live in it every day. You're out here spinning around in it. You're doing all kind of stuff, but... Hey, I'm closer than I was when I was youth pastor, but it won't be too long. It won't be too long that my family will gather and say goodbye to my earthly body. This won't be too long. 30 of the years that I had on this earth are gone since I was here as a youth pastor. It's gone. The next 30, if I get that many, will go quickly. My citizenship 
should not be here. Paul wrote this verse. Paul loved his citizenship. Paul's point of view was, I love my Roman citizenship. Probably no one in Scripture used their citizenship more than Paul. Because Paul, when he would get, they would, you can't flog him because he was a Roman. So Rome would say, flog this man. And Paul would go, whoa, 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 I got my, uh, got my passport. It says, Rome, I'm a Roman citizen. And they would go, whoa, don't touch him. He loved that. He'd wait right up to the flog and show my ID. He, was, he used it, man. So the man who loved his Roman citizenship said, but this is not what I'm about. All of you listening to me today, I don't know where you're from. They were in first service. There were people from other nations. Congratulations on your citizenship. I've got one too. I'm, I'm a United States citizen. I love it. Love it. It's so beneficial. I love it. If I'm in another country and I come back through that place they call customs, you have to go through there and you walk up and you say to them, Hi. Hi. Come up, sir. Yes. Where you been? And you tell them what you've been doing. You answer the question. They, they, ask, they love to talk about fruit. You got any fruit with you? No, I don't have any fruit. I love to ask you about fruit. And then they say, have your passport? I sure do. Can I see it? Yeah, absolutely. Hand it to them. They open it up. Horrible, horrible picture. That is identical to how I look. It's awesome. <laughs> and then they say, well, sir, you're all good. Come on in. Ah, thank you. It's a nice little thing to have. But that won't work. On that last day, that's why Paul said, don't bank on that one in the end. Use it out here, but when it comes showtime and you stand before your creator, flashing that card won't work. What works is, Jesus, I, I recognize that you created me for your purposes, and I ask you to forgive me for all my chasing, the emptiness and the identities of this world. And today my point of view changed. This is what happened for Paul. He spent his life out there killing Christians until God changed his point of view. So you say, but Dan, I'm wor worse than Paul? You've killed people by the droves? I don't think so. So if you find in your identity out in here, I invite you today up here because this is who you truly are. And I want to say, as I sat on the stool, the one thing the Lord, at the very end of my time of working on this message, sitting on the stool in my office, the one thing the Lord laid on my heart very clearly to say to you is this. Somebody listening, I don't know who it may be, two people, I have no idea. Stop striving so hard to figure out who you are. Start here believing you're created by your creator accept him believe it start there stop listening start identifying first as God's kid start here it's changed the game for me I confess that I found my identity way too much do I have days I still struggle with it? Absolutely, it's called humanity. But I get my time here, and I'm peaceful. I'm content. And I just today believe the Lord laid on my heart to speak to you about finding your identity in the Lord. What we're going to do is we're going to close with a song, beautiful song, Who I Am in Him. As the Lord speaks to your heart, if you would choose to do so, just stand. Don't do it right away. Listen to the words when something ministers to your spirit. Or if you just say, boy, God, I've been fighting this a long time. I want to accept you. If you choose to stand just because you'd like to stand, perfect. I don't want anyone to feel embarrassed. But I want you to connect with your creator. As the Lord speaks to your heart, Hannah, come on out, begin to sing. Let's worship the Lord. And as the Lord speaks to you, maybe we start with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Just pause. Just talk to Jesus. Find your identity in Him. As the worship song begins, seek Him. Let Him speak to your heart, and as He speaks to you, just stand.